Hi, my name is Robert Haas, and I work here at Enterprise DB as the Chief Database Scientist. And this is my talk on avoiding, detecting, and recovering from corruption for Postgres Vision 2020. Uh, we only have about 35 minutes today for this talk, so uh, there's a limit to what I can talk about in that amount of time, but I've tried to fit in as much as I can that will be useful to you, or that I hope will be useful to you, but it will be a fairly brief introduction to the topic for that reason. Here's an outline of what we're going to cover. I'm going to start by trying to give a definition of corruption. Then I'm going to talk about the three main causes of database corruption at a very high level. I'm going to spend some time talking about best practices for avoidance of database corruption and for detection of database corruption. After that, I'm going to talk a bit about some signs that you may have database corruption. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about how you may be able to try to recover your data in the event that you do have database corruption. So let's start with a definition. Uh, I came up with this definition. I said, database corruption is when the database contents are altered in such a way that queries behave in an unexpected manner relative to the SQL statements previously executed. So for example, if we insert some data into a table and we don't modify it, we don't delete it, we don't do anything else to it, and then later we try to retrieve the contents of that table, we expect that we ought to get the same data that we stored. If we stored the number one, we shouldn't get back the number two or the number five or the number 237 million. We should get back the same data that we stored. So if we get back different data, that's perhaps database corruption. Or if we get an error, that's database corruption. Or if the system crashes when it tries to read the data, that's also database corruption. But in each case, for it to actually be database corruption, there's one additional criteria that needs to be met, which is that the problem needs to be with the contents of the database. There has to be some problem with the files on disk, with what is actually stored. If the data that's stored on disk is perfectly okay, and the difference in the results or the error or the crash is due to some other cause, such as a bug in the database software, then we still have a very large problem, but it's a different kind of problem. It's not a database corruption problem. So at a high level, there are basically three ways that this kind of thing can happen. The first one is that we might have bad hardware. And most commonly, that means a bad disk. Uh, all disks go bad. Even very expensive disks go bad. In fact, disks go bad quite a lot. Uh, if you only have one disk, it might take a number of years before it actually goes bad, although it's pretty much guaranteed to happen eventually. But if you have a lot of disks, then one or the other of them will probably be failing nearly all the time. Uh, and that can certainly cause database corruption. Occasionally, we also see bad memory. Uh, it, if you have bad memory, it can actually happen that the data in the database corrupt, gets corrupted before it ever actually reaches the disk. Uh, that's much more unusual, but it does happen from time to time. The second high-level cause of database corruption is bad software. For example, we could have uh, some kind of a bug. And actually, there's a lot of things that could potentially have a bug. There could be a bug in the database server itself, a bug in Postgres. Uh, it could also be a bug in the operating system kernel. It could be a bug in the file system. It could be a bug in your backup tool. It could be a bug in your disk controller or in your RAID controller. There are a whole lot of different pieces of software that need to work together correctly in order for Postgres to give you correct results. And because all of those are complex pieces of software, they all have bugs. Basically, any complex piece of software has some bugs. And many of those bugs are fairly benign, but there are probably data corrupting bugs of some sort or another in all of those places on your system. And so if you experience database corruption, it could track back to any of those things. The final high level cause of database corruption is user error. Uh, 
One that I've seen particularly frequently is faulty backup and recovery procedures, but uh, there are quite a number of things that you can do wrong that will result in your database getting corrupted, and we'll touch on those things a little bit more later on in the talk. I'd say that out of all of these causes, probably the most common of the three is user error. Actually, I think all of these things happen fairly frequently, but I would say of the three, user error of some sort is actually the most common cause of database corruption. So let's talk about best practices. How can we avoid uh, or at least be able to detect database corruption? I've divided up these, these up into four categories, backup and restore, configuration, storage, and administration, and I'll be talking about each one of those in turn. So we'll start up art with backup and restore. The main point here, the most important point here, is that you need to take backups. You need to take them regularly. Uh, there are two reasons for this. The perhaps Probably the most obvious reason for this is that if you are taking regular backups and then later you notice that you have some database corruption, you may be able to restore from a backup and avoid having any permanent data loss. But there's an additional benefit which I'm not sure everyone always appreciates, which is that the very act of taking a backup proves that all of the data in your database is still readable. It doesn't prove that all of the data that you're reading uh, in the process of taking the backup is the same as the data that you hope is on your disk, but it proves that there is something on your disk that is capable of being read. And that's really not something you should take for granted because uh, you know the hardware and the software can fail. And if you never actually access the data, you don't really have any way of knowing whether it's still going to be there when, uh, when you do eventually try to access it. It's important not only to take backups, but also to make sure that you can restore your backups. Uh, and that actually you need to go a step further and not just run the restore script and see that it produces some files, but actually start up the database and make sure that those restored backups look okay. If you have a backup, but you can't restore it, or if you can restore it, but the result doesn't contain the data that you're expecting it to contain, uh, then it isn't actually very useful. The other really important thing about backups is that it is a really good idea to use a professionally written backup tool rather than a homegrown script that you wrote yourself. There are a lot of things that you can do wrong when you are writing a good backup tool. Uh, there are a lot of different kinds of mistakes that people can make. Some of those are pretty obvious mistakes. Some of those are very subtle mistakes. One thing I've seen quite a number of customers do when they write their own backup script is that they don't bother to put in any error checks. And that's clearly a very, very dangerous thing because all of the steps that are involved in taking a correct backup uh, are things that can fail. And if the script doesn't detect those failures and respond to them properly and report them properly, then you can easily end up in a very bad situation. Of course, if you do use a professionally written backup tool, it doesn't guarantee that there will be no problems, that there will be no data corrupting bugs, but at least you can hope that the person who wrote that tool had a lot more time to put into creating that backup tool than you would have had into creating your own script and hopefully also that person is more knowledgeable than you about some of the things that can go wrong. So I really recommend looking into, you know, either the tools that EDB offers in this area or uh, other tools that you may, uh, that you may know about or that you may find on the internet that are produced by uh, reputable companies that really do a good job putting together uh, tools that will take good care of your data. Uh, moving on to configuration, there are basically three database settings uh, within Postgres which affect the uh, reliability from the, of the system from the point of view of database corruption. Uh, they are F-Sync, Full Page Writes, and Wall Sync Method. And uh, the first two are pretty simple. You need them turned on. You do not want to use F-Sync equals off. 
you do not want to use full page rights equals off. The default for these settings is on and you should leave them on. Uh, if you turn them off, it is very, very easy to end up with a corrupted database. Uh, for example, if you have F-Sync turned off and you have an operating system crash, it is extremely likely that you're gonna end up with a corrupted database unless the system was basically completely idle at the point of the crash and had been idle for some time. Similarly, if you turn full page rights off, uh, you are less likely to end up with a corrupted database in the event of an operating system crash, but it's still pretty likely. Uh, sometimes people think that they need to turn these off or that it would be safe to turn these things off for one reason or another, but that's not really the case. Uh, they're, uh, they're dangerous settings, and I strongly recommend that you don't turn them off really for any reason. Uh, full page rights is the sort of setting that sometimes people do a detailed analysis and they convince themselves that they don't really need this turned on. Uh, in all of the cases where I've had a detailed conversation with someone about it, it has turned out that their analysis was flawed uh, and that it wasn't actually uh, safe to turn that setting off in their environment. So uh, you really just need these things turned on. The other setting that has an important effect on reliability in this regard is the wall sync method setting. Uh, unlike the two settings that we just talked about, the default value is not necessarily safe. And this is also not just a Boolean, but a parameter that actually allows one of a number of different values. Uh, on Mac OS X, for example, the default value is fsync, but that's not actually safe. And if you want to have reliable crash recovery, you need to set it to fsync underscore right through. Uh, I am not an expert on Windows, but I have been told that on Windows, you need to either use the fsync or fsync right through setting, or alternatively, you need to disable write caching on your drive. Uh, a general practice that I would recommend is to use the PG test fsync utility, which is included in every distribution of Postgres and check whether the method that you have configured is unrealistically fast compared to the other methods. Uh, of course, everybody wants to choose the fastest possible method of doing this, and that's why we have the tool. Uh, but some operating systems, some file systems, some hard disks have a tendency to report that the data is safely on disk before it actually is safely on disk. And that sort of lying to Postgres is the kind of behavior that can easily result in a corrupted database. So you want to be on the lookout to see whether the method that you've chosen is unrealistically fast. If it is 10 times faster than all of the other methods or 100 times faster than uh, all of the other methods, it's very likely that it doesn't actually work properly. Uh, and that's really something that you want to watch out for. One other piece of configuration, which is not a, a setting, but another kind of configuration, is you may want to consider enabling checksums. Uh, to enable checksums, you need to run initdb with the dash k option uh, at the time when you create the database cluster. If you have already created the database cluster, you can create a new one, or uh, if you're running version 12, you can use pg underscore checksums with the dash e option to enable checksums uh, after any in initdb time. Uh, that command, pgcheksums-e, has to be run while the database cluster is shut down, but it runs quite a bit faster than dumping and restoring your whole database into a new cluster, so you may find it useful for that reason. The advantage of running with checksums enabled is that you're more likely to notice if you have corruption. It, it obviously can't prevent your database from becoming corrupted. There's no way for Postgres or any database product to prevent something other than the database itself from modifying the database files or to prevent that thing from modifying the database files in a really bad way that's going to mess everything up. However, if, for example, the storage uh, device has a problem and it makes an unexpected modification to one of your data files, the checksum is likely to fail and then you'll get an error so that you can at least notice that something has gone wrong and uh, uh, that's really useful. 
uh, for this to have value, it's uh, really important to actually keep an eye on your logs so that you notice when those errors show up. But if you do that, uh, this kind of thing is really, really useful. Okay, uh, moving on to the third area of best practices, let's talk a little bit about storage. Uh, I really recommend that you keep your storage stack as simple as you possibly can. Uh, one piece of advice that I think is really good is if you can, use local storage, not a network file system. I know that may seem a little bit antiquated in 2020, but there's just a lot fewer ways for it to fail. Uh, there may be ways of setting up things like NFS or iSCSI or other uh, kinds of complex storage systems so that they work reliably, but I have seen that a lot of the systems that people are actually running in practice are not reliable. They tell Postgres that the data has been durably written to disk when in fact that's not the case. Uh, and then it's quite easy to end up with a corrupted database in the event of a crash. So the simpler you make things, the less there is that can go wrong. If you're Even if you're using local storage, you still have Postgres itself and your operating system kernel and your drive controller and maybe your RAID controller uh, that can fail. But as soon as you introduce a network file system involved, you have a network card on the local machine and a network card on the remote machine uh, and maybe a switch in between them and a bunch of other things that can go wrong, including the networking protocol itself. Uh, NFS causes a lot of reliability issues in this area. Uh, if you need to use it, I do recommend that you use NFS v4, uh, that you use a hard mount rather than a soft mount, and that you set the sync option both on the NFS client, that is the server which is mounting the partition, and also on the NFS server, that is the machine which is exporting the partition. And I recommend that you check it carefully and make sure that it actually seems to be uh, delivering the semantics that you expect. Um, you should also use RAID. Uh, RAID is a really good way of avoiding database corruption. RAID 10 is a particularly good choice for database systems because it means that for every disk you have that contains your valuable data, you have a second disk which contains the same data. And that means that if something bad happens to one of the disks, you still have a second disk and you haven't lost any data. You can simply remove the bad disk and uh, you should be back in business. Uh, you should, of course, not rely on RAID to not fail because everything fails. Disks fail, RAID controllers fail, everything fails. Uh, you still need backups. You still need standby servers. You still need all of those other things. Uh, but RAID is a good tool in your arsenal to decrease the chances of a failure from which you can't recover. I recommend a lot of caution when you're choosing a file system on which to install Postgres. Uh, my experience is that the most reliable file systems uh, on which to run Postgres are ext4 and XFS. These are, I think, probably the two most commonly used uh, Linux file systems and I think the fact that they are so commonly used is a big advantage because it means that they've been pretty well debugged even in all sorts of strange situations uh, where uh, bugs in the file system code might otherwise go undetected. There are a lot of other file systems available for Linux and uh, some of those things are very popular. They offer cool features. Uh, they have other properties which seem very desirable to people but I've seen things like ZFS uh, actually cause serious, very serious database corruption problems that really can't be explained by anything other than a bug in ZFS. Uh, I think those bugs may have been on ZFS on Solaris rather than ZFS on Linux, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I've definitely seen a number of other file systems, uh, including NFS, but also uh, a number of others cause database corruption problems as well. Uh, I think there's just huge value in having something which is very thoroughly debugged. Uh, and so I recommend that you use that as a major criteria in choosing uh, the file system that you use. Back in the days when ext3 was popular, that had a lot of bugs that actually had really serious uh, negative, impl negative implications in terms of database reliability. And ext4 seems to have gotten a lot of that stuff right. Uh, it seems to be very, very reliable. and uh, 
Uh, as I say, ext4 and XFS I, are, I think, the only two file systems that I know about where I've never heard a user complain about a uh, database corruption problem that could be tracked back to the file system. Okay, the final area of best practices is uh, related to database administration. And I feel a little bit silly saying this, but it is really, really important that you do not modify the database uh, files in any way. Uh, the binary files that are in the PostgreSQL data directory are files which the database itself is expecting to manage. It is not expecting you to modify them. And if you do, there is an excellent chance that you're going to corrupt the database. Uh, the text configuration files are, of course, fine to modify with a text editor, and that's why they are text configuration files. But the files that are in some kind of binary format are managed by the system, and it is not expected that you're going to do anything to them. Uh, so in particular, please don't remove files. Don't remove files from the pgwall directory, formerly known as pgxlog. Don't remove files from the pgxact directory, formerly known as pgclog. Don't remove any files from anywhere. Don't modify any files manually from anywhere. I've given this talk a few times now, and after the first time that I gave it at a conference, a whole bunch of people came up and asked me about this slide, and they said, well, here's the kind of manual modification that I'm doing. Is that okay? And I listened to all of them carefully, and I told all of them no. Uh, and I actually wrote a blog post about that, that that is linked here in case you're interested in reading more about some of those conversations. A uh, related point is don't run antivirus software. If you do have to run antivirus software, please at least exclude the data directory from the scope of what the virus scanner is going to look at, but also realize that that may not be good enough. There are definitely antivirus programs which don't completely exclude the directories that they have been told to exclude. And uh, when you think about this, I think it's sort of obvious why this is a really big problem. Uh, antivirus software goes around and quarantines files, which basically means it deletes them. Um, and it also removes viruses from files, which means it modifies them. And Postgres is not expecting that anything is going to modify or delete its files except for itself. And so if you have some other software which is modifying those files or deleting those files, you are very likely to end up with problems. You should also, and this is very important, not remove the postmaster.pid file. Uh, if you do, you could end up with multiple copies of PostgreSQL running at the same time, uh, which will definitely corrupt your database in very serious ways. One thing you can do, and this is a really good idea, is to perform some plug testing. Start the database up, run a workload against the database so that things are happening and the system is busy, and then remove the power and see whether things look okay when you bring the system back up. And try that a few times. If it works okay every time, that doesn't prove that everything is working, but if it breaks right away, that definitely proves that something is wrong. Okay, so let's suppose that you follow all of these best practices to avoid database corruption and to uh, detect database corruption, but uh, things still go wrong. How will you know? Uh, in my experience, the most common way that you realize that your database is corrupted is you start to see strange errors in the logs. You won't necessarily see strange errors in the logs. I mean, if you store the integer 1 in the database and due to some problem with the disk, the 1 turns into a 2, uh, unless you have checksums enabled, there's not going to be an error. You're just going to get a different result when you try to select that data from the database. Um, but uh, when you have serious corruption, it, it often modifies enough stuff inside the database that the database itself realizes that there's a problem and then you get errors. There are unfortunately a pretty wide variety of errors that are possible depending on the exact nature of the problem that you have. But generally you want to be on the lookout for errors which seem to be complaining about things internal to the database system as opposed to errors which seem to be complaining about user facing things. Uh, and we'll see some examples in a minute. It's worth keeping in mind also that database corruption can sometimes cause crashes or wrong answers or infinite loops rather than simply causing uh, errors. And those problems are pretty tricky to diagnose. Uh, 
Uh, but that having been said, error messages are the most common way that this kind of problem manifests itself. Here are a few examples of messages that suggest database corruption. Uh, the first one is saying that it could not access the status of transaction 3881522 because it could not open file pg underscore exact slash 0003 because there is no such file or directory. And even if you don't really know what this message is complaining about, it should worry you because it's complaining about something internal to the database system. It's not like that's a file you created or a transaction identifier that you invented. Those are things that the system invented that you and your application know nothing about. And if they're not in a state that the database is happy about, then something has gone wrong. And the thing that has gone wrong may be a database corruption problem. Uh, the second one is similar. Uh, it's complaining about not being able to read a certain block of a certain file. Again, that's not a file that you created. Indirectly, perhaps, you created that file by creating a table or an index. But you didn't choose the name base slash 45678-90123. The database system chose that. Uh, the database system managed the addition of blocks to that file. And the fact that it's now unable to read some block that it thinks should be there can't be your fault as a user. Uh, contrast these kinds of messages that we see on this slide with something like a foreign key constraint or a unique constraint. Those are things which definitely could be caused by your application because your application could try to insert data which violates one of those kinds of constraints and then you would expect to see an error message which is complaining about those things. But those would be complaining about your data or the data that you attempted to put into the database, not about the kinds of internal things that these messages are complaining about. So uh, yeah, these, these sorts of internal messages are a hint that you might have a database corruption problem. Uh, and they're all kind of, you know, they're all kind of uh, similar sorts of things and that none of them are complaining about uh, things that come directly from the user. They're all complaining about internal things of one sort or another. Okay, so let's suppose that you tried to avoid corruption and it didn't work uh, and you got corruption and fortunately you were able to identify that you had corruption and now you want to do, know what to do next. Well, the th First thing to understand here is that you really want to avoid trying to recover a corrupted database. Once a database has been corrupted, there's no sure way of going back. If the database contents have been altered in some way and you no longer have your original data, then you don't. And there's no magic wand that anyone can wave which will bring back the data that you had with 100% certainty. That's really what corruption means. So anytime you try to get your data back from a corrupted database, you can't really be 100% sure that all of that data is good and that there are no problems. So you always want to look for ways of getting the, of avoiding having to recover a damaged database. So, you know, if the problem is only with a standby, just rebuild the standby uh, and, uh, don't worry about it too much. Uh, I mean, maybe find the root cause, but don't try to fix the broken standby. Similarly, if you have a problem on the master and you have an unaffected standby, you might want to fail over to the unaffected standby, or you might want to consider restoring from backup. Uh, sometimes people have Postgres databases which actually replicate data from some external source. And in a case like that, you might just want to throw away the entire database and re-replicate from that external source rather than trying to recover the corrupted database. Only if none of that is possible should you try to recover the corrupted database. Uh, I'm gonna just insert a little bit of a disclaimer here. I'm gonna tell you how I usually approach this problem, but uh, I want to uh, be very clear that if you try to follow these steps, you do so at your own risk uh, and it is entirely possible that you may lose or further corrupt your own data. So please proceed with extreme caution. Uh, if you are an enterprise DB customer, uh, please consider uh, consulting with someone in our support department. Uh, get a hold of an expert who can help you. If you are a customer of some other company, uh, 
uh, you might want to consider switching to enterprise DB, but uh, in the meantime, you should contact uh, your own PostgreSQL support provider and, uh, and, and get their help in dealing with the situation. Uh, this is a very risky and dangerous situation, and uh, it's really easy to make things worse. Uh, so I'm, I'm giving you this information in the hope that it will be useful to you, uh, but uh, there's no guarantee of any kind. So that being said, uh, if you decide to try to recover some data from a corrupted database, the first thing you should do is copy all the files. Uh, and the reason you should do that is because when you try to get your data out of those files, you might make things worse. In fact, it's pretty likely that you're going to make things work. You're going to be applying powerful and dangerous tools uh, to your database in an attempt to get your data out of it, and things can go wrong. So if you've copied all the files, then you have at least have a pretty good chance of getting back to where you were before you started using those power tools. And that's, uh, that's a good option to have. Now, once you've done that, uh, I, I strongly recommend that what you should do is try to use PG Dump to do a logical dump of your database, to back up the contents of your database uh, as text, uh, and then restore them into a new database created by a new initDB. And the reason I recommend that is because if you just hack on your existing corrupted database until it seems to run again, there's actually a good chance that there are latent problems which you haven't detected, which are gonna cause you problems in the future. So uh, I really don't recommend the approach of just beating the database until things look okay and then continuing on and assuming that they actually are okay. The dump and restore approach is really for the best. Now there are a couple of problems that you can encounter when you try to do this. Uh, the first problem is that you might find that you're unable to take a dump because you can't even start the database. And uh, the good news is that there is a tool that can help you with this problem, uh, and that is called PG Reset Wall in newer versions or PG Reset Xlog in older versions. And that will very often fix a problem. Uh, well, let me say that a different way. It will very often allow a damaged database to start it will not actually fix anything. In fact, in some ways, it breaks things worse than they were already broken. But it will, generally speaking, make a database start. Uh, it's very useful, for example, when the necessary wall files have been lost or corrupted and there's no way to recover them, or similarly for PG control. In those kinds of situations, if you run PG reset wall, your database will still be corrupted, but it will probably now start, which gives you a much better chance of getting your data out of the database. Uh, if the database is so badly corrupted that there's absolutely no hope of starting it, for example, perhaps you've lost nearly all of the database files and you just have a few files left and you want to recover whatever data you can from just those files. In a case like that, you're never going to be able to successfully start the database, but uh, if you use the PG file dump utility, uh, newer versions of that tool have some options which can allow you to recover data from raw files even without a running server. So uh, I would recommend that if you're in that situation, you look into that tool. Uh, if you get the database started, the next problem that you might encounter is that uh, the um, uh, the dump of the database might fail. Uh, sometimes PG dump uh, will just fail because of one specific object that has a problem. You know, it has sanity checks built into it, and if your database is corrupted, it might not be very sane, and so things might fail. And uh, if that problem is due to just one specific object, one thing you can do is consider just dropping it. Uh, if it's something like an index uh, and the data is in the table, you don't really need the index, you can drop it. If it's a temporary table or some other kind of temporary object, you can drop it. Um, if you have a problem with an index that can't be dropped, uh, you could try re-indexing that index in order to make PG dump uh, happy. And if you can't make PG dump happy enough to be able to dump out your whole database, you could also consider trying to dump individual tables or schemas using the options which PG Dump provides for that purpose. Or you could even try to dump just part of a table by using something like a select statement with a where clause that is designed to exclude the part of the table that has the problem so that at least you can get out the data that is in the other parts of the table. 
Uh, there's a hidden column called CTID, which represents the physical position of each row in the table. Uh, and filtering on that clause can be very useful because you can uh, use that to try to dump out a specific row that you know is okay, rather than looking at some other row that has a problem. Or you can try to exclude a row that you know has a problem and just dump out the other rows that are okay. So that's pretty useful. Um, Enterprise DB also has a tool called PG Cat Check uh, that uh, if you download that and install that and run that, will tell you about all of the problems that it knows how to find with the structure of your system catalogs. Uh, I find that pretty useful in these kinds of situations because system catalog problems are one of the really common reasons why PG Dump fails. And so if you're able to address those problems, then there's a good chance that PG Dump will succeed. And uh, that's, uh, that's the first step in getting your data out of the database. Um, now, if you manage to get a dump, you might think that you're pretty much in good shape because now you have all of your data in a text file or some near equivalent of a text file uh, and you can just restore it into a new database. And uh, that's not quite true because even though you've got your data in, uh, in text format now, uh, it can still have logical corruption. For example, it might be that the corruption in your original source database resulted in broken foreign key constraints or broken unique constraints. Um, and so when you try to restore the data onto a fresh database, those problems uh, prevent the data from loading without error. And if you have that kind of a problem, you need a human being to decide what to do. The database can't decide automatically what to do about a broken foreign key constraint or a broken unique constraint. That's something where a human being will need to uh, study the data and apply business logic in order to figure out uh, what to do. For example, if there's a, uh, a duplicate row, you might choose to delete one of the two rows so that you don't have a duplicate anymore, or you might choose to merge them in some way, or you might choose to delete them both or something else. So there are a variety of things that could be right to do, and somebody who understands what the data is intended to mean will need to make a decision between those options. Uh, if you get all of that done, and you've dumped your data, and you've reloaded your data into a new database, then you've uh, probably got yourself back into fairly good shape. Uh, again, there's no uh, absolute certainty that you have all of the data, the, the same data that you started with. Um, but at least you know that there's no uh, latent corruption in the database metadata from the original uh, database that's going to cause you problems later because you've transferred everything over to a completely new installation. And that's a pretty good place to be in these kinds of situations. Uh, so I hope this information was helpful and uh, thank you very much. And I believe we're going to be taking a few questions. Thanks a lot. Hi. <clears throat> I don't have audio. audio. Oh, here we go. Okay, I will ask. Okay. So there's <clears throat> the first question. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Is there a preferred safe value for wall sync method for Linux servers? Um, so not really. I think that any other values are fine. Oh, man, we got feedback. Uh, let me see. If I... Okay, I don't know. All right, I'm just going to um, So I think uh, in terms of F data sync, the default value is, uh, sorry, the default value F sync on Linux is F data sync, and that's a perfectly good default. So uh, there's not really any reason to change it. Um, you might get a very slight performance value from some other setting, but I don't think it really matters very much. OK. Uh, and another question you mentioned turning on checksums. The question asks, what is the performance overhead for enabling checksums? Uh, it depends quite a bit on your workload. In some cases, it can be quite small. 
um, it can be, you know, uh, negligible or, you know, one or two percent. But uh, in other cases, uh, depending on exactly what your usage pattern is, I think you could get up to like maybe 10 percent, something like that. Um, so if you're concerned about it, it's really something you should test. Okay. The next question says, I assume the backed up wall files are similar to Oracle's archive logs. Can it be applied to the database to recover the database to a point in time in the past? Uh, yes, it can. That's a feature called point in time recovery, which PostgreSQL has had for a long time now. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just uh, the only piece of advice that I would give there is do use a, a backup tool for that uh, unless you are very sure that you're following the directions and the documentation uh, correctly and precisely. Okay. And then this came in when you were talking about corruption, and I think it's meant as maybe something other than backups because you were talking about backups. It says, can we rely on replica? using sync streaming replication against hardware failure? So in general, I would say yes. Um, replicas are a really good way of sort of providing yourself with some insurance against hardware failure. However, there are a couple of things you want to be aware of. Um, one is that synchronous replication is not necessarily going to be your best option. I actually have a blog post called uh, Synchronous Replication as a Trap. Uh, where I go into some of my thoughts about choosing between synchronous replication and asynchronous replication. Uh, so you might want to have a look at that. Um, maybe consider not using sync replication, depending on your use case. Um, and the other thing to be aware of is that, you know, against hardware failure, uh, that's a pretty good choice, but it's good to supplement it with other techniques, such as backups, uh, just in case somehow the corruption gets propagated from your, uh, from your primary tier standpoint. All right, another user asks, uh, you mentioned using tools for backups. Do you have any suggestions besides BART? Uh, well, I am not really an expert on all of the non-EDB tools that are out there. I think uh, PG Backrest and uh, Barman are two of the more commonly used ones, but uh, it's not something that I know a whole lot about, so I can't really uh, say that I suggest those things. I can just tell you that they're out there and you can investigate them. Okay. Another question asks, is there any native Postgres capability for monitoring logs and alerting the admins of storage-related errors? So there's not like a specific module that does that kind of thing, but in general what's going to happen is that if there is a storage-related error uh, that is reported to the database by the operating system, uh, the database is going to log it. Uh, so that goes back to the point that I made during the presentation about log monitoring. Uh, it's actually really important to uh, to keep an eye on your logs and see if you think, see messages like I.O. error showing up there. Uh, if you do, uh, then that's not coming from the database being complainy. Uh, that's coming from the operating system telling the database that there is a problem um, and the database uh, recording that in the log. So that would be the, the way to find out about it. Okay. Uh, one of the users asks you to go deeper on the ZFS issue. Uh, what about ZFS on Linux? You have experience with corruption. Uh, yeah, actually, I went back and checked my notes during the presentation, and I found that we had a case of extremely uh, severe corruption on ZFS on Linux with one of our customers uh, not that long ago that seemed to be uh, clearly attributable to a, a ZFS bug. Okay, and here's another question once again about the corruption issue showing up in the logs. Uh, is there a full list of error messages that can be used to detect corruption from the Postgres logs? Uh, unfortunately, there is not. Okay. Um, so in Oracle, you can recover to a point in time prior to the corruption or to the time the corruption occurs, as long as you have the archive log files. Can Postgres do that? Well, you do also need to have a database backup uh, from, from before the point in time to which you want to recover because you can only recover forward. So you have to start with a base backup that precedes the time when the problem happened um, and then roll forward using your archive blocks. As long as you have those things, then yes. Okay. 
Okay. And we got another question. Do you have any tools to examine the index? I assume it means for index corruption. Uh, yes. So there's, uh, there's a few tools available. They're not really that easy to use, I think. Um, PG File Dump can be used for that. Uh, that's been around for a while. Contrib Page Inspect can be used for that. Uh, and I think uh, Peter Gagan's new PG Hex Edit tool can also be used for that. I don't think any of those tools are super easy to use because they're really intended to be used by database developers who are trying to understand where uh, you know, things are going wrong on a very deep internal level. Um, they're not necessarily designed to be super accessible to regular end users, uh, but you can certainly give them a try. Okay. Um, this question is kind of generic. Hopefully we can figure out what it meant. Is there a way, a way to deal with corrupted walls and archives? Um, well, that's a, that's a difficult problem, actually. Um, typically what happens if your right ahead logs are corrupted is that you're not going to be able to continue uh, with the database recovery beyond the point where you reach the first uh, corrupted wall record. Um, so uh, there's not really an easy way that I know of to overcome that problem. So uh, again, it comes back to having good backups that you can fall back on. Okay. If checksums are enabled, dump will fail on a corruption. How to identify all rows residing in an affected page to use select for copy data out of the corrupted table? Um, so there is a setting that you can use to uh, disable the errors from checksums. I believe you, what you can do is change them to warnings. So then if the data in that page is otherwise readable, uh, you'll be able to read it. Um, if the page is so badly messed up that it's not possible to make any sense of it, even with the checksum errors ignored, uh, then you're just out of luck because your data is gone. And uh, quick question, is there a flashback feature available in Postgres? Uh, there is not. Um, is there anything in Postgres that's like the data dump export in Oracle? Uh, I believe that would, be, that would correspond to the PG underscore dump utility. So I think yes, um, but I'm not familiar with that particular Oracle utility. <laughs> so somebody really wants to dig into ZFS. They want to know, are there any specific parameters which would cause such an issue you described, like compression, deduplication, maybe? I, I don't uh, have that information available uh, right at the moment, and I don't think it would be appropriate to share specific details of individual customer experiences. So I, I can't really comment on that. Okay. Um, can we roll back in Postgres as an undo if data is corrupted accidentally? Uh, you cannot. You can only roll forward from a base backup using the wall archives. You cannot go backward. And then can you please provide an enterprise DB tool for physical backups uh, and walls, archived logs that can be used for point in time recovery? Uh, so that tool is called BART, uh, which stands for Backup and Recovery Tool. And um, could you give a brief usage on the, the PG test F-Sync? Um, yeah, it's pretty simple. You just run it. Uh, it doesn't take any meaningful arguments that you need to worry about. Uh, you just run PG test F-Sync and you look at the output. Um, and the main thing you're looking for is the relative speed of the methods. And in particular, whether you've got certain methods that are running much faster than others, uh, which, if it's the case, should make you suspicious that maybe they're not actually working properly. Okay, and that takes us to the last question. We have a little bit of time remaining if anyone wants to sneak one in to the questions and answers tab. It looks like that may be all of them. Robert, thank you so much for your talk. All right. Thanks a lot, Mark. Bye.